Hello, my name is Mark Baer. Welcome to Muse at live at the Museum of Monterey. Uh, Muse means to consider, Muse, Muse means to inspire. The Muses are our inspiration, and uh, Muse is what happens in museums. And my guest today, Elizabeth Murray, I'm proud to have here. Uh, we had an event last week uh, at, that Elizabeth gave a, uh, a fabulous lecture and a uh, slideshow consider, concerning her new book, Living Life in Full Bloom, 120 yeah. Daily Practices to Deepen Your Passion, Creativity, and Relationships. And first of all, before we even get started, where can people buy the book? Right locally, <laughs> you can buy it at a Luminata Bookstore in Monterey and Pilgrim's Way in Carmel. And any good bookstore, you just ask for it. We want to support our local bookstores. And you can also get it anywhere online. Oh, so let's start. I mean, this is a massive undertaking. I, I've been kind of following your progress. You've been working on this for many years. Uh, this is a big, um, you've, you've really put yourself out of yourself and into something. So this is something. Uh, let's, uh, for, the, for the audience that doesn't know you, let's talk a little bit about who you are first. I am an artist. I am a gardener. I have um, made gardens. I, I, I'm a photographer. I've been pho a professional photographer for 30 years. I've been going, I helped restore Monet's garden in France, and then I've returned there for over 30 years to photograph it. And I make books and calendars and have had large exhibitions with Monet's paintings in museums all over the Re country. Recently in New York. Right. And let's, yeah. let's talk about that a little bit. Well, that was wonderful. That was at New York Botanic Garden, and they used my photographs um, large, really large, and all the way down to apps um, on the phone and on buses, and we had 370,000 people that came, so it's just, wow. it was just remarkable. In the book, we talk about the four paths. Mm -hmm. Let's articulate the four paths. Well. I thought, what is most important to me? What could be my, my contribution? What do I think the world needs? So what I came up with is the path of the gardener. The gardener is humble, and I'm known to be a gardener. I can easily speak in metaphoric ways about the garden. So I want to encourage people to have intimacy with nature, to re-fall in love with nature. And just like having a pet where you really love your animal, you can communicate, it's, it's like that with nature, that you fall in love with it. So I use the pathway of the gardener. Then the second one is the pathway of the artist. And that is to really deepen and expand uh, creativity and imagination. I love being a painter, I love doing art, but it's also a way of thinking. It's a way of reweaving community and values. And the third p pathway I call the pathway of the lover. And that, for me, is about leading with your heart. What you love, you commit to. It's, it's not just your children or your tree or your backyard. It's to think about a, a wholeness, a wholeness. And then the fourth I call spirit weaver. And that is about celebration and ceremony and ritual and gratitudes and blessings. It could be a good toast at a party. It's about creating fun and with meaning. And, and I think it's really important to bring spirit back into daily life, non-denominational, but pure spirit, bringing it from yourself. You write about this, but you live this life. And let's just, uh, I've been to your house. I, you live uh, at the Rollo Peters' old house. Yeah. Rollo Peter, a, uh, one of the premier painters of the Monterey Peninsula, known uh, famously for his nocturnes. Uh, and again, you took on this labor of love. Uh, uh, and so you both have the artist spirit in that house and you have the garden. So let's, let's just talk about, because you had to roll up your sleeves on this one. Oh. You've walked the walk. Here. Oh yeah, actually we've, I'm just doing another big repair project, huge. <laughs> But it's, it's a house that I love. I fell in love with it, and that's leading with your heart. It's not necessarily being practical. It's falling in love and saying, let's save it. It was going to get knocked down and more big houses built. And it was Charles Rollo Peters, he built it in 1900, 
And then when, in 1906, when his friends lost their studios and all their work in San Francisco at the earthquake, he said, come down, move here, let me add on a room, let me add on a cottage. And it became an artist studio, and it has a spirit. And it's been divided up, but I thought, it has one acre left and two little shacks. Let me, let me redo this. And so it was with miracles and with prayer and great cooperation from my city, Monterey, which I love, uh, who helped me make it historic, and I got some grants. And so, yes, it's been a huge labor of love. Um, but it's enlivened now, and I teach art there, and I show my art, and I make my art, and I do my writing, and I invoke the spirit of place. I say, help me, help me, let's do this. Let's inspire other people. And so we have wonderful people now living on the property along with myself. And it, so it's a feeling of uh, creativity, definitely there. Yeah, so you've, you've done that. So let's talk about full bloomers. Well, the second uh, section of the book, After the Pathways, I call um, full bloomers. And these are actually six stories of different friends of mine who are individuals and couples who I feel really have um, an example in their life of living those four pathways people that have delight and contribution, that are artistic, that um, live, live with the heart and with spirit. And so the stories are very inspiring. There's a children's book writer um, and illustrator, Lita Judge, and she has some struggles with her health. And so that's very inspiring to read about her. There's Lily Ye, who has been making beauty in the most broken places of the world, um, remarkable all over the world. Um, there is uh, my friends um, Melanie and Duncan Berry who have worked with community. Right now they're working with uh, fishermen and making sustainable food um, and working with children and ocean literacy and music and tunes in the dunes. There's lots of wonderful stories that can inspire uh, people because they're all regular. They're not they're personal friends. They're not like up there unreachable And I think their stories are really special, you know, and they're they're people that I I just love and I feel like that is my wealth is with my friendships and so the full bloomers are um, They're just a delight and there are you know, you read the news and you can become very uh, down at the mouth, but there are remarkable people doing remarkable things. Yes. And with that is accessible. Yes. Uh, you know, that to everyone. In other words, what, what I love about the book, which I'm going to hold up again, and <laughs> we, we really need to, uh, you, can't, you can't do this enough as a, as a writer of books. I just so understand <laughs> how difficult you. your undertaking is here. Uh, what, uh, what came across particularly in, in your lecture and in your, in your book is uh, you're, you're talking about complex issues, um, uh, living a spiritual life, living a life in balance, living uh, simultaneously these full, four paths, uh, living in nature. And s sometimes these can be, to a general audience, esoteric a bit. Mm -hmm. And you've managed to make, open the door that everybody can, have this in their life and, and, and you've presented it in such a way that you've opened the door that people can walk through. And Good, I, I find you. that a, a, quite an amazing skill and quite an amazing accomplishment. And I was wondering, you know, what I was asking you before we started taping is, did you always have that skill? What is your, what is your transformation been? In the spiritual way? Yes. You mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, as a child, I was always a seeker. I was raised Catholic and I'm very kind of strict Catholic, but I always questioned it. Um, and I, I love diversity. I love travel. I love learning about different kinds of people. And I believe that respect for others um, and curiosity of other ways of doing, believing is really important. Um, it, it broadens everything, but it also helps create peace, um, that mutual respect. So even as a teenager, I started going to Zen Buddhism, uh, Judaic um, practices, um, went to Quakerism, which I really loved a lot, um, meditation and peace, 
being really strong in peace. Um, I love experimenting. I got to live in Japan for, for a summer at 17, and that was a wonderful influence. Uh, but being a spiritual searcher, and I feel like I really see a lot of spirit in nature. And where we live here is just full. It's just so full. Being out on the bay and seeing all these incredible animals out there, going walking in Point Lobos. And then for me, like painting, you know, that is a spiritual practice. You know, drawing something, looking at it. Teaching a child, you know, enlivening a child's spirit, holding them. Um, I think that we can think of things as almost everything can be spiritual. And we right here have the most languages spoken of anywhere in the world. So therefore we have all this diversity. And we have a big military presence here with our language school, Navy postgraduate. So we have an opportunity to really bring a sense of peace and um, an idea that we're going to be ambassadors. You know, I think in Little Monterey, we have an opportunity to really make big international influence. So my pathway has, um, I, has been through personal search, and I studied with uh, Angela Sarian, a cultural anthropologist for 18 years um, with conflict resolution and uh, relationship study. I have um, traveled extensively, and that, that has been a contribution. Let's, 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 uh, a contribution. let's talk uh, cultural anthropology a bit. Tell me, mm. tell me what you've learned there. I've learned about respect for diversity, and uh, I've learned a lot about spirituality and ritual, um, and how spirituality in nature, and um, and how to really hold my own personal rudder, you could say, so that when difficulties hit you, you can get back up. Um, something really sad or something that uh, financial or health-wise or emotional that really knocks you how to get back so you can have certain practices, um, ways of right speech, of re-entry, of, of boundaries, of, um, of respect and love of all ages. Um, very much uh, nature, creativity that can be spiritually based, um, to be your own disciple, to be in discipline, not discipline that means you don't get to have fun and play, that everything is an expression, um, dance or music, that it is all, that joyousness is part of our, it, it's part of what makes us whole. And it's, it can be a spiritual practice. And doesn't mean egotistical, I do it all for myself, but it's, it's a way of bringing that integrated happiness and things being in balance, creating the balance. I'm Mark Baer, my guest is Elizabeth Murray. The book, Living Life in Full Bloom, we'll be right back after a short break. The Museum of Monterey at Stanton Center is for the community, by the community. Our mission is to tell the stories of Greater Monterey with an emphasis on history, arts, innovation, and our maritime heritage. Throughout the year, we bring you intriguing exhibitions and stimulating events. But to continue to be a center of excellence, we need your donations. Please become a member today. Simply go to our website, museumofmonterey.org, and push a button. And if you make a larger donation, I will come to your house and sing you a medley of your favorite love songs. And remember, the Museum of Monterey at Stan Center could be the perfect location for your rental event. Check it out, museumofmonterey.org. Hi, I'm Mark Baer. Welcome back to Muse. We're live at the Museum of Monterey. My guest, Elizabeth Murray, her book, Living Life in Full Bloom. And so let's, let's go through the book a little bit. Let's talk about some of the practices. One of the practices is about play. Um, play is, 
I notice when I teach creativity, and I, I teach it to a lot of CEOs, and they, they come to my house, and you know, very wealthy people, some you know, with their own airplanes or bodyguards or so many jewels, it's remarkable. And so what I have to do is to, I teach non-perfection, and that's something we talk about in the book, so that you get away from that and, and get away from comparing, oh, he's so much better than me, I don't think I'm very good, and, and you just get into play so that you lose yourself. You lose that self-consciousness, just like a child, and you go into delight, and then you're not so attached to the outcome, and then you can experiment, and you can just kind of be in there, and, and you lose time and self-consciousness, and then something can emerge, and then you can work with that. So that's one of the ones. Well, I wanted to just point out that the book is not self-help, it is self-joy. Yes, uh, I love uh, that. Yeah. You're, you're, you're fun, which is, I, I think people have a responsibility to be fun yes. on, so, on some certain level. And so much of your, uh, what you're suggesting is about, almost on every level, is about play. It used to be hard for me to do a lot of play because I always felt like I had to work, you know, and had to accomplish. And, play was frivolous, but the truth is I'm really playful, and playfulness brings delight and joy and spontaneity and like a freedom, and to think, oh, I have to go to work, that's a completely different thing that I, that I get to play. I get to give myself this gift of joyousness, um, that I get to write, I get to paint, I, I'm taking photographs. It's a, it's, there's a completely different thing when I get to experiment with my photographs than if I'm just like <laughs> all uptight about it, you know? And that's true if we have that play sense, we're more engaged and can engage others. And this is important, I think. And, and as a very imperfect person, I love the idea of imperfection. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a bit of a master of imperfection, so I really <laughs> totally relate to that. Um, let's talk about two, two things, and you can go in order. One is the importance of ceremony and ritual in your life, and the other is the idea of the artist and his relationship to the community. It's interesting, this past weekend we had two major ceremonies just uh, with graduations. Um, ceremony can be your marriage, your graduation. It can be something really big. It can be a celebration. It's a celebration. It's a, it's a, sometimes it's a community ritual um, where the whole community shows up. So you, you get to celebrate or honor or thank, or let someone know that we're proud of them, or that we're standing behind them, that we um, recognize their accomplishment, or that you take that pause, again like play, you take that pause for joy, you take that pause in your busy life to say, I accomplished something, you know, and this is a, a celebration. And, I think celebration and ceremony are often similar, but sometimes ceremony is a little more formal, often it's more formalized. Um, but to create rituals, and a ritual could be something as simple as lighting a candle in front of a loved one who died, or lighting a candle and just making a wish like we do at a birthday cake, and having a, a candle for each birthday and then you blowing it out um, so that we're recognizing those years. Um, it could be something that, that we formalize when we meditate and we have a flower and we have certain pictures that mean something to us so that we create something where timing in our lives have, um, they create the, a pause and a recognition. In our climate, we don't have as much with um, seasons, but seasons, I mean, not as distinct as back east, but seasons create a natural uh, celebration or ceremony or ritual. All of a sudden, it's the first day of spring, you can really see it, or the snow came, you know, it gives it to you in weather. Ours are a little bit more subtle. But it's the passage of time that you mark for meaning, to create more meaning, and it doesn't have to be with materialism. It's meaning and purpose. And one thing that's important to me is ways that we reweave community. And I think that 
museums and bringing in inspiration to people, that's a big way to reweave, especially when we welcome diversity and we, we welcome different voices, um, different ways of doing things, different points of view, women, men, youth, people of color, people of, of different ages. You know, this, this helps us say that we're all apart, we all count, and we get new ideas. And the pathway of the artist for me is really about helping stimulate imagination and creativity in all kinds of parts of our lives. The way you dress, the way you set your table. I mean, we have these farmer's markets, which that's where I do most of my shopping, and that's, that's a place where you have community. Let me just tell you a personal experience here. Good. Because I have, um, it, at the museum, I have so many people coming through. And the diversity, I met Jose Ortiz. Oh, good. And Jose Ortiz is a muralist from yeah. Salinas. Yeah. And he's been writing on walls in Salinas and documenting what he calls uh, Hijos del Sol, Children of the Sun, and documenting this first immigrant experience mm. and what it means to come to America, what it means to rediscover America, what it means to create yourself anew. And so as someone, you and I, many generations here, we forget. Mm -hmm. And so seeing it like through his eyes, mm -hmm. fresh eyes, mm -hmm. what that diversity brings, it's not a matter of, you, we, we think of diversity in terms of tolerance. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of tolerance, it's a matter of, of, of riches. Yeah, what, the, what these pieces, people are, are, are are, are bringing us. Absolutely, and, you know, and respect. And, and, and this was you know, a bit of a revelation to me. I mean, you, you, you think that shit, it was, it was a, a revelation to me how knocked out I was and the value I saw in this. And, you know, and this is kind of what, this is accessible to all. And this is a, a bit of what, what you're talking about. And uh, um, also youth, which we're talking about. Let's, let's talk about that, the importance of passing this on. I love to invite children in the garden, engage them in different ways, or do art. My two favorite things is nature and art. And I'm gonna have a little nature and art camp for my um, niece and, and cousin's daughter uh, this summer. But I have neighborhood children or different children that I invite in or go places to teach. This summer I'll be teaching the youth at a mindfulness camp on the beach in Oregon. Um, and s there's something about mentoring, like when we get to a certain age or a certain mastery, a certain accomplishment, I think wealth is about um, what we know and what we can give, what we can offer. And when we offer something, um, it also enriches what we know. You know, it, it, it just makes everything better. So I, I really, I've been mentored by some of the best people in the world. I mean, people I just totally love. And I, I um, in my gratitude to them, and also in me being a teacher, I just love to teach youth or have a young person go, let me, let me inspire you with photography if that's what you love, or art, or with these children at the uh, mindfulness camp, it's they, you know, making candles in the cave and making their little altars and meditating, and they're like, like uh, ten and twelve year olds. Amazing, you know. We make these mandalas out of leaves and. Let's just talk about physically how long, what a process this oh. was. <laughs> Let's talk about this labor. So they, less, less they think this was a real easy thing. Let's talk about what, what did this take. Well. The truth is, I, I've worked on this book about four years, and it looks small and it's pretty. Um, and we spent a long time designing every page of it. In this book and the third part, I, I talk about life mapping as a way to follow your passions, your gift, gifts and talents, and what you want to contribute. It's a process that I teach about how you articulate what are your gifts and talents? What are your skills? And some people are really shy about their skills, especially women, they, they're very shy about them. Um, they discount a lot. And what are your passions? What do you really love? What are you excited about? The ocean, golf, museums, theater, what is it? 
and make your list. And then what do you feel the world needs? What do you feel right now, in your opinion? And then you create action plans and a way to have contribution and purpose um, to combine all those. And then there's also a, a point of how to keep balance financially, health-wise, um, spiritually, mentally, physically. Because sometimes we overextend and we don't have any more money, or we overextend and our health goes. So in, this is a wonderful, wonderful um, action um, workshop to do, or follow in the book and do it yourself. So I did it for myself for a number of years, and this book is the result of it. Um, and it took me a lot of discipline. I had, I had over a thousand uh, ideas. I made charts and charts and charts and little cards and all these things. Then it's all about discernment. What are the most important things? What can I weave together? I felt like a weaver that had these golden threads and I had to hold them all. I couldn't do as many social things because I, I was holding all my threads you know, to weave together. But I also, everything has to be fun. It still has to be playful. So most of my photographs, and there's over 200 in here, I took with my iPhone and layered apps, which is really fun to do. And I spent a lot of time with, with my friends, Duncan and Melanie Berry. Either they came down here or I went up there and we would cook together and eat together and work, work on ideas and go to the beach and we'd support each other in our businesses and our visions and play music and laugh. And so it had to keep that liveliness. But um, sometimes I'd get up at four in the morning um, because the muse was calling me. Uh, sometimes I'd work really late at night, but always put in at least 10 hours a day writing. Thank God my muse sleeps late. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, just, just before we go, so one of the things we talked about the other day, and I shouldn't probably be talking about this on camera, but you're talking about asking permission to shoot flowers. Oh. Asking the flowers for you, because I shoot a lot of flowers. Oh, do you? And so, Guys and girls are different because it wasn't a permission. It was much more of a flirtation. I've been <laughs> Flirting is all right. So, it's, it's a, we have a di so you may be asking their permission, but what goes on with the guy and the flower is a whole different deal. But I love the, uh, I, I love the ask. Yeah. And they all say yeah. Yeah, good, good. They would say yes. <laughs> so. But it, it's the idea of giving a compliment. You're so beautiful. You're so beautiful. May I take your picture? Yeah. You know, or, or, or just recognition and instead of just, just taking. All the lines that never worked in real life, they all work in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> Give me five. Always fun. Uh, the book again, Living Life in Full Bloom. My guest, Elizabeth Murray, uh, just a great honor. You're a master. Aww. And um, this has been Muse, uh, live from the Museum of Monterey and uh, go to your bookstore. Thank you. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. Bye-bye.